chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, I apologize for the late start today, but it was, I think it was important for you guys to hear the testimonies of the young people that went to camp <clears throat> so that you can see how you're helping to impact their lives. We're in Luke chapter 17. We're going to pick it up, verse 11. It says, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Right? And as he entered into a certain village, there met, him, there met <clears throat> ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving, them, giving, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Brother Charles, would you pray for us, please? Yeah, I know. All right, amen. This uh, Luke 17, <clears throat> um, this should be a familiar passage to you. Um, if it's not, then and I'm gonna, we're going to expound a little bit today. But Luke 17 is a great chapter. And Luke 17 is where you, you, we get a lot of real good things from Jesus about forgiving seven times in a day. Um, we get Lord increase our faith from this chapter, from, from Luke 17. We get um, um, this passage here. Uh, we also get, as it were, in the days of Noah right so shall it be right we get remember lot's wife from this chapter right i mean there's a lot in this chapter it's 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 just jam packed with full of things that are useful for us right and in our passage jesus is heading back to jerusalem and he has to pass through galilee and if you're here on sunday nights you, we went over this we're at the samaritan woman at the well in, in john chapter 4 but Galilee's in the north part, up by the Sea of Galilee, and that whole central part that, where that Jordan River is, that's called Samaria, right? And he has to pass through there on his way to Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't tell us where he did this occurrence happens. It just happens to say a certain village. And that really doesn't matter whether it was in Judea or it was in Samaria. It doesn't really matter. But um, he was very careful to point out that there was one of these people that he helped to heal, that he had this encounter with Christ, that was a Samaritan, right? Right? And, he, and, he's, and he, meet, he meets ten lepers, right? And, and he healed them, but he didn't do it in their presence. He says, go show yourselves to the priests, right? So when they left Christ, they were still lepers. And then somewhere along the way, they realized they were healed, right? And one of them turned back. Um, and the reason they had to go show to them themselves to the high priest is because that's found in Leviticus chapter 14. Chapter 14 was the passage where um, you had to show yourselves unto the priest if you had a certain spot or it looked funny or whatever, and he would declare you, he would, se he would separate you for a time, he would declare you clean or unclean, and if, it, if, if, the, if the spot did certain things, then, then uh, you were considered leprous and unclean. If the spot did other things, then maybe, maybe it was just uh, something else, an infection or a scab or something, and he sent you back, uh, back to normal society. <clears throat> 
But the point was, you had to go show yourselves to the priests to be declared clean because if you were unclean, if you had leprosy, you weren't allowed in the camp. You weren't allowed in the congregation. You weren't allowed to sit with your, your friends and your family. What did they have to do? They had to have a leper colony outside of the camp, and they had to have someone who bring you provision. They had to have somebody bring you half, go halfway and bring you food and water every day and, and the necessities and, and make sure you had things that you needed. And they would leave it there, and then they would leave, and then the lepers would come out and get their stuff. So you were out without the camp. You were outside of the camp. Um, and 10 of these men along the way got healed. And when one, they all realized they got healed. And what, I could just imagine that happening, and how they sprinted even the faster to the high priests. But one of them turned around. And it doesn't say he ran back up to Jesus and crashed at his feet. He just says that he turned around and with a loud voice proclaimed, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right? Now, you can read a lot of things into this, and 10 is the number of the Gentiles, right? And the one who returned was not a Jew. The one who returned to, to praise God and give him what he, what he needed, uh, what was expected of him, what should have happened, the thankfulness and the gratefulness, he was the only one who was not expected to do those things to Jesus. He was a Samaritan. He wasn't a Jew. He was not, Jesus was not their Messiah, his Messiah. He was a Samaritan. So a couple things about leprosy. It's a picture of sin in the Bible. And we're going to use that illustration today. Leprosy is a picture of sin. Once you have leprosy, there's no getting rid of it. Now, I know the World Health Organization tells you that today they don't even use the word leprosy anymore. They change it. It's called Hansen's disease. Why? Because they don't want to associate it with the Scripture. Well, they'll tell you, well, we can give you a six-month regimen of these antibiotics, and if you've got a really bad case of it, we can give you a year-long regimen of these vitamins and these things, and it's going to go away. It never goes away. It just goes to the point where it's undetectable. You can't see it. It doesn't manifest itself on your skin anymore. It's hidden. You can't get rid of it. And it causes lesions on your skin. In real bad cases, it causes nerve damage to the point where you can't feel your extremities. You ever seen a picture of a leper and they don't have, they're missing fingers? Well, the reason that is, the leprosy doesn't do that. What happens is they don't realize they've hurt themselves or cut themselves, and then it gets infected, and then they got to cut it off. I saw a picture when I was doing some research for this of a guy who was missing half of his face because he got cut and didn't realize it, he got an infection. And they had to remove all of his nose and part of his cheek and down into his neck. Sin infects. Leprosy infects. Once you got it, you can't get rid of it. We're all in the same boat. And, and ten of these men were living without the camp, living on the outside of the camp, having to rely on others um, to, do, to take care of them. And they were living in a horrible condition. Um, and and <clears throat> those ten are going to die from this. That's not, that's, that's not a, 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 an opinion. Those ten men that Jesus encountered were going to die from leprosy. It was going to kill them. Until Jesus came their way. And there's three similar things that all of these men had in common. And the first thing is that they all had the same problem. They all had the same problem. Everyone here has the same condition. Just like they had a problem with leprosy, and leprosy is a picture of sin, we have the same condition. We have the same problem. We have a sin problem. And there's no way of getting around that. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. And without the proper treatment, we're going to die from that. Everyone has the same condition. We have a sin problem, and it's going to kill you. We're going to die in our sins unless the high priest declares us clean. Now, I, I, now I, I'm going I'm to let you in on something here. When I say the high priest, I mean Jesus Christ because in Hebrews chapter, 11, Hebrews chapter 13, it says that he is our high priest. He's our high priest. He's the one in heaven who makes intercession for us, 
right? He speaks on our behalf. He's not just an intercessor. He is the one who speaks on our behalf, not just the one who speaks on our behalf. He's the one who comes to God in our, in our place. We have a high priest that intervenes. There's a difference between someone who intervenes and someone who intercesses, right? But only he can pronounce our clean, uh, us clean. And there's no such thing as a little bit of leprosy. It starts out as a little spot, and you don't know what it is. And then it grows, and then it gets bigger. And no matter what you do, no matter how many vitamins you take, no matter how many supplements or how many oils you put on that thing, it still grows and grows and grows. There's not a thing in this world that you can do about that problem. And that's just like you. There's no such thing as a little bit of sin. But once you have it, and you all have it, it grows and grows and grows. It doesn't matter how much ointment you put on it. It doesn't matter how much you cover it up. It doesn't matter how much gauze bandages you have on there. It doesn't matter how clean you look to the outside. You're infected. You have it. And there's no getting around it. Well, preacher, I don't do X, Y, Z. I don't do this. I don't do that. None of that matters. None of that matters. Well, preacher, I don't smoke. I don't drink. None of that matters. You still have a problem. Well, you know, preacher, I know, it doesn't matter. Smoking and drinking never split a church. You know what split a church? You know what splits churches? Christians who don't know how to keep their mouth quiet, mouth shut. Churches who don't know how to use their tongue. Christians who don't know how to use their tongue. Christians who will talk around and talk and, and go behind and, and, and clo- behind closed doors and whisper things about the preacher and get other people. You know what that is? That'll split a church. Well, which, one's, which one's worse, smoking or drinking or that? It's sin. A gossiping Christian will split a church faster than someone who goes outside and lights a cigarette. Now, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not condoning any of those sins. I'm not doing that. So don't say, well, preacher said I can go smoke. That's not what I said. All right? Well, preacher said as long as I don't talk bad about his wife or his kids, I can go out and have a cigarette. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's the same. It's a sin. Now, there are some sins that God puts a heavier weight on. There are. But murmur, murmurings, murmuring will split a church. It's wickedness within the church that splits a church. It's wickedness within a church that causes problems. And when people bring the wickedness from the world into the church, we have an issue. And not only does the person have a sin problem, but now the church has a sin problem. You know what's hindering us from revival? Wickedness in the church. Wickedness in the church. That's what, that's what look, I, I'm of the opinion that we're never going to have a national revival in this world, in this country. And I'm sorry to have that opinion. Maybe that's just me being pessimistic. Maybe that's just me trying to see the world for what it is and, and really letting that, that stuff get to me. But I don't think we're ever going to have a national revival in this church. I mean, you remember those days when Billy Sunday would go into a town and they would shut the liquor stores down? And guess how many liquor stores opened back up? The bars would close, and then the bars would never reopen. Right? We're never going to have those things in this country again. Because too much of the world has crept into the church. The church can't even get on fire for God. How are we expecting the heathen to get on fire for God? We have a sin problem in the church. And unless our high priest touches us and cleans us, there's no way for us to get rid of it. It's just not going to happen. You know, you ever hear those, those Christians say, well, I don't do this or do that. You know what that is? That's pride. That's pride. You have a sin problem just like I have a sin problem. The second thing they all have in common is they all, they all cried the same thing. They, they had the same problem, and the second thing they did, if, you, if, you're, if you're into the homiletics, is that they all plead the same, they all cried the same plea. They had a problem, they cried the same plea. Do you see the P's, right? We're gonna, you're going to get a third one here in a second. That's, that's, that's what they teach you in school. 
right? They all had the same, pr- <laughs> that's Brother Nolan, that's right. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So uh, they all had the same plea. What did they cry? They cried, Master, have mercy. Did they not? All of them, all ten of them had a problem. And they cried, Master, have mercy. That's the plea. Each and every one of them made that plea, and they got clean. Just like each and every one of you, I'm going to make the assumption that if you're here today, you're saved. Each and every one of you had a plea, Lord, I need your help. Have mercy on me. Why? Because if you don't, you know, look, I didn't get saved because, uh, because some preacher said to me that uh, he died on the cross for your sins and this and all that. You know what he told me? He says, you're going to burn in hell. And I went, I don't think hell sounds fun. <laughs> and he says, I know how to fix that. And he showed me Jesus Christ. And he said, Lord, yeah, you got to tell him, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, show your grace to me. Thank you for the sacrifice you did for me. Lord, save me. When Peter was on that water and he took his eyes off Christ, everybody's heard that illustration. Everybody's heard that story. Peter took his eyes off Christ for just a second. And what happened to him? Boom, she started drowning. What did he cry? Lord, help me. Right? When all else fails, cry, Lord, help me. That was a great prayer. It's exactly what Peter needed. And who was there? Who was faithful and just to forgive Peter of all of his faults? And there were faults. And who was there to reach his hand down and say, I got you, Peter. Right. That's Christ. That's the same one here who healed these ten lepers. And all, every single one of them had the, had, the, had the wherewithal to say, Lord, help me. Show me mercy. And the last thing, sorry, I'm cutting it kind of short, but, you know, all these testimonies that these young people gave were so good that I let it run in some of the preaching time. Well, wait a minute, I just fed you all breakfast. I'm just going to preach. And they got the same purification. They all had the same problem. They all cried the same plea, and they all received the same purification. You know, the Lord doesn't discriminate on who gets saved and who doesn't. He doesn't say, well, you cried mercy unto me. I don't think I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to give it to the guy next to you. He says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He's not slack concerning any of his promises. That any man who comes to me, that all should come to repentance. Any who comes to me, those are the ones that I'm going to give salvation. It doesn't matter if they're lepers. It doesn't matter if they're sinful. Some of those people had leprosy worse than the others. He healed them all. They all received the same purification. They all cried that plea, Master, have mercy. And then they all received the purification. You ever stop to thank the Lord for that? You ever stop to tell the Lord, man... Thank you for saving me. I mean, maybe you did once you got saved. Lord, thank you for saving me. How many times after that have you said, Lord, just thank you for saving me? I mean, that's where it starts. If you can be, if you, look, if you can be thankful for that, that's just the beginning of being thankful for a lot of other things. Because he's done, he's done more than just save you. He's done more than just clean you up. And... How many of us have ever just thanked God for saving us? You ever sat back and thought exactly about what Christ did for each one of you? Have you? No, I'm not just saying, okay, the generic answer, he died on the cross and, you know, he shed his blood. uh, Has any of you ever thought about that for a second? And really understood what Jesus Christ went through and that he didn't have to do that? And he still did it anyway? And then he accepted you and me? Me? Why would, you, why would you do that for me? I'm not worth that. We had a brother, <clears throat> young man, at the youth camp. He was having a time. Preaching really got to him. And after the preaching, they let us go blow off some steam. We've been in the chapel for like three and a half hours, four hours, right? We've been in the chapel for nearly four hours. They let us go blow off some steam at like nine o'clock at night. So they let the kids go off and play, and we did some gym, and we had some activities for them. And there's just one of these kids. He's not a kid anymore. He's, he's 18. And he's just on that hillside, and he's got his hat in his hand, and he's just doing one of these. And he's just, he's, you can tell, man, something really been, 
And, and, and I sat down next to him. I said, I said, brother, is there anything I can help you with? And he said, no. And I said, you want me to give it a shot? And he, and he says, why me? That's what he said. He said, I didn't deserve it. I said, brother, none of us did. And he looked at me kind of funny. None of us deserved it. Not one of us was worthy of Jesus Christ's blood. Not one of us. And he just looked at me. I, I'll never forget that look. He just, what do you mean? None of us were worth it. I did it anyway. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to love the Lord, man. It's so easy to love Jesus Christ. I mean, what's there not to love about it? I mean, think of all the things he's done for you. Look, if he saved my soul, if he did all of that for me and then left me to rot here on this earth for the remainder of my days, he's still been good to me. Better to me, better to me than I ever deserved. But he heard the plea. He heard the plea from afar off. Lord, have mercy on me. And he cleansed me. And he kept me, and he, ke he keeps me safe. You know, you, each one of us was afar off, unclean and dying. And just like these lepers, they were made nigh. Jesus came up to them. If you were a leper, you weren't allowed to go up to somebody and start talking to them. That's not the way it worked. When somebody started walking your way, you made a berth for them. When Jesus walked up their way, he says, just stay right where you're at. And he walked right up to them. I mean, got right up to them and said, uh, how you doing, bud? Oh, sorry about that. How you doing, bud? Why don't you go show yourself to the priest? And they looked at him and says, I've already shown myself to the priest. That's why I'm out here. I got a problem. And he says, shut up. And go show yourself to the priest. Now, they knew who he was because they cried, Lord. They'd heard stories about this man about this time. And he says, okay, let's go show ourselves to the priest. And that's when, when they believed God, what he said, that's when the miracle happened. When they went to go show themselves to the high priest. And last I checked, I was living outside of camp. Last I checked, there was, there was a time when I was outside the camp. Last I checked, there was a time when I was alone and filthy. And last I checked, there was a time that would make a wide berth of me because I was walking down the road. Boy, God sure has been good to me. You know why people don't come close to a leper? Because they don't want their filth to rub off on them or their uncleanliness would catch them. God changed all that. You ever think about that? You ever think about how God changed that for you? You ever thank God for that? Because last I checked, Jesus healed 10 of them, right? How many came back? One. How many came back and told the Lord, thank you. Thank you for showing me mercy when I cried unto you. One of them. One out of ten. One out of ten. There's one out of ten of us that might ever amount to something. That's the ratio. That's the, that's the standard that the Bible gives you. Look, if there's a hundred people in church... We're not quite there yet. We'll get there. If there's a hundred of us in this church, that means there's going to be about ten of us who be sold out fire for God. And the rest of us are going to try. Maybe they might do a little. You know, but let me tell you something. One out of ten is the ratio. There's one at one of every ten churches that will ever amount to anything for the Lord. That's sad. That's a disgrace. Just like one leper came back. And said, thank you, Lord. One returned and the other ten went off. And they never turned back. Now, I, you know, so let's try to make some excuses for some of these people. 
Let's see what, what happened to some, what happened to the other nine? Well, there's a lot of different things that might have happened to the other nine. Well, you know, some people are just maybe simply have forgotten. Maybe they were so excited or caught up in the moment, right, that they were, they were, they were lepers and then on their way and then they realize they weren't and they get to the priest and the priest says, you're, you're clean, you're good. They got so excited and in the moment they just simply forgot to go tell God thank you. Well, preacher, didn't Jesus tell them to go show themselves to the high priest? Yeah, they sure did. They did. But let's think about that for a second. You mean to tell me that Jesus wouldn't have let them come back and cast themselves down at his feet and say thank you? I promise you, he would have let them. It never hurts to show thankfulness. But these people are they're just forgetful. Brother Knowles, if anybody knows who Brother Knowles is, I heard him preach a message right here one time about forgetfulness, and that's where I got this from, this forgetfulness part. And he says, they went to the land of forgetfulness. That's where they went to. Ten of, not, ten of them got right, and nine of them went to the land of forgetfulness, and one of them went to the land of thankfulness. That's good preaching. Some of them forgot to thank them. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of them were just unthankful. Because people expect blessings. So people, some of them went to the land of forgetfulness and some of them went to the land of unforgetfulness if we're going to keep that, role, that, that, that theme going. Some people have come to expect blessings. American Christians have come to expect blessings from God. We're spoiled. I mean, real spoiled. I mean, I, I, I was stuck at a, at a youth camp. Oh, how did I say that wrong? I wasn't stuck there. That was a blessing to be there. I was stuck in a cabin with 14 other boys. Okay, let's just say that. Thank you, Lord. Right? I mean, the smell. Um, no. No. The snoring? That was, that was mostly me. But, but let me, man, I tell you, yeah, we had a couple of them talking in their sleep. Yeah. But let me, let me tell you something. Um, I'm thankful for those things. That bed was hard as rock, man. It was as uncomfortable as, I mean, I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and I'm just like trying not to wake everybody up going, mm, yeah, oh, uh, uh, and they open that door, and it goes, Greek. bang, bang, bang. You <laughs> just need some WD-40 in that sucker. But man, but, and, and you know, by the time you get back, you get all those things worked up and a little bit loose and a little bit lubricated and you get right back into that bed. And a couple hours later, when the sun comes up, you roll out of bed and you go, oh, yeah, oh time to get up, boys. I'm thankful for that. Because I saw the impact it had on some of our young people. Man, I'd go sleep, I'd go sleep on, a, on a rock, see, some, see the Spirit of God move the way it moved this week. And he did. Let me tell you something uh, about that last, that, that last meeting on that Friday night. Pastor Peacock had already preached at him four times. It was the fifth time he was preaching at him. Look, and, and you guys can back me up on this. I don't think I'm going out on the limb too much here. But he wouldn't have had to set a cotton-picking thing. All he would have had to do is get up there and say, Hey, boys, girls, the altar's open. And they all came. Because the Spirit of God was moving in that place. He wouldn't have had to preach the message. He didn't have to say nothing. And there were so many people that, were, that the Lord had been working with, and working on for four days now. He would just said, hey, whatever's on your mind, come up here and get it right just now. And they would have flocked, man. I mean flocked to that altar. We had 120 kids. 120 kids. And when he said there wasn't a dry eye, dry eye in the house, he wasn't wrong. And you know where they all were? They were all down at the altar. I mean, you could, you ever hear that expression, you could have heard a pin drop? That wasn't good enough. I mean, you took, took a piece of straw and dropped it. And you could have heard it until someone started sniffling. <laughs> because after that, I, I mean, it was all quiet. He was like, all right, come on. And everybody blocked. And then it was just this, this quiet that fell over the crowd. It was a hush. 
And then slowly you start to hear, and then maybe a sob, and then, and then you, you see the boys doing one of these numbers, trying not to see, let the girls see that they're crying, you know? I mean, I mean, I, let me tell you something. I'm thankful for that. I'd sleep on a hard bed for the rest of my life if the Lord worked like that. That's nothing. That's nothing. My comfort is nothing. But us, but us American Christians are so un, unthankful. We forget how God has, how good God has been to us. You know what happens when we're unthankful? We actually rob God of some glory. That's what happens when we're unthankful. There's a Bible verse that says, can a man rob God? And the answer to that is yes. He absolutely can. When you're unthankful for something, you know, sometimes we go through things in life and the Lord intentionally does it for his glory. I mean, that was part of one of the messages that Brother Peacock um, that Peacock preached and Brother Lance he, he very much the same message different 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 illustrations but he you know he had to be put through some things in his life so God can get the glory and it wasn't until they realized that that's the reason they were put and you know thank the Lord and really drew closer to him that the, that the Lord delivered them from their problem unthankfulness We abuse God's grace and His mercy. We rob Him of His glory because we receive blessings and never turn to Him for thanksgiving. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I want you to see something because this is important. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for, for the, even their women dared change their natural use to that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, and burn their lust one toward another, men with men, working which that which is unseemly, and receiving in them that recompense in the error, <clears throat> error which was meet. You know what it's talking about here? It's talking about sexual perversion. It's, talk, it's, talking about, it's talking about the homosexuals. It's talking about the gay agenda. Right? It's talking about sexual perversion. Well, why, how did that doesn't fit in this message at all? Sure does. Sure does. Look at 21. You don't want to know why this happened? 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. You know what your lack of gratitude towards God leads to? Perversion. That's what your lack of thankfulness to God leads to you're unthankful you're ungrateful and it leads to perversion it leads to immorality because we can't take the time to say thank you lord you want to know it's not just that we don't take the time it's that we don't have the mindset we don't have the mindset of thank you lord for saving my soul thank you lord for making me whole Thank you, Lord. I figured you guys were going to sing it. I'm sorry. <laughs> By great salvation, so rich and free. Amen. They got there because they were unthankful. Sodom and Gomorrah got there because they were unthankful. And the last thing, and I know I'm past time, but... You're just going to have to forgive me for a minute, but maybe the nine went back to life as normal. Some of them were forgetful. Some of them were just unthankful. But maybe some of them just went back to life as normal. They went home, and after they went to the high priest and realized that they were clean and they can return to their lives, maybe they went back to their family for the first time in years. And I understand that. I do. 
I get that. You've been departed from your family, been separated from the family, from the people you love, from your husbands, from the wives, wives from their husbands. It says men here, so I'm going to say husbands from their wives. And they just got caught up in, I can go back to normal, that they never thought about God. Maybe they found their friends. Maybe they went back to their old jobs because while they were gone, no one was there to provide for their family, so their family's destitute now. So maybe they just got caught up in real life. They got caught up in the cares of this world. For these nine, maybe the world and the cares of their life just got in the way of them praising God and giving Him some honor. And they just couldn't find the time to return back to Jesus. Does that sound like anybody you know? I just don't have the time to go to church. It's my only day off. Well, I can't go to church because of this or that. I got I got this going on today. I can't go to church because, you know, that's when that's when the boys play softball or that's when this happens or that's when that happens. It's an excuse. It's an excuse. Don't tell me you can't make time for God. You can make time for God. But we get so distracted by the things of this world, we get so pulled off of things that, that are going on all around us <clears throat> that we forget God because we're so distracted by these things. They couldn't find their time to return back to Jesus and show him the honor that he was worthy. What it boils down is that we Christians are being self-centered. That's what it is. We're being self-centered and self-serving. We have a self-serving attitude as Christians. And because of that, we don't make time for God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says, For men are lovers of, of themselves. Verse 4 says they are lovers of pleasure more than they're lovers of God. We just rather make time to go do whatever we want to do. Oh man, it's supposed to be a beautiful Sunday. It's supposed to rain all day Saturday. We're supposed to go to the beach Saturday, so we're just going to go to the beach on Sunday. Go to the beach after church. You know what the next verse says in 2 Timothy chapter 3? That they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So you look all good in your life. You tell everybody you love God. You tell everybody God's important to you. And then you never make time for him. You have a form of godliness. And you deny Christ when you do that. You deny the power of God when you do that. God's trying to give you something and you say, nope, I'm sorry. I don't have enough time for you right now. I have to scroll through Facebook and see what I missed the last week. Now, I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to call you, you young people out. Now, one of them took off on you. Two of them took off on you. So, I guess it's just you. All right. How long did it take you to get caught up on your social media? By the time they were home, they were already bored with their phones. They got their phones back, so they called their mamas. Mama, I'm I'm on my way home. I'll be there in a couple hours, right? (laughs) The point is, the point is, they were gone for a week, and everything that they would have consumed in a week, they had figured out by the time they got out of South Carolina. So you know what the rest of this time would have been? Wasted. I mean, just wasted on nothing takes you no time to get caught up on the ways of this world nothing important is happening right now well you know the preacher you know you got the presidential debate i don't care nothing important's happening none of that is more important than jesus christ Uh, but i can't i just can't seem to find the time preacher you keep telling yourself that you keep making your excuses that's fine i'll let you go make your excuses it's not my job it's not my job to make sure you adhere to, 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 the, to that. It's my job to give it to you and let you make the decision yourself. Think about what it just says. Think about what Jesus says. That one came back. The Samaritan, the one that was least likely to do anything for the Lord, 
He comes back and says, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for having mercy on me like I cried out to you. And he just looks at him. He looks at this man and he's confused. And he says, were there not ten of you? Were there not ten cleansed? He said, brother, where's the other nine? Do you not all have the same problem that they had? Did you not all make the same plea that they had? Did you not all receive the same purification that they, they received? Then why is it you know, the, the, that according to the statistics, one out of ten of you are likely to come to him and live for him and stop, and stop living in the world and live for him? Why is it statistically likely that one out of ten is going to do that? Miss Sandy, if you would come up and play something for us here in just a moment. Why is it that we, we are so hesitant to step out into this world and tell somebody about Jesus? Why is it that we're so unlikely to actually live the way he tells us to live? Why is that? Why is it so hard for us just to show him the honor that he deserves. So if there's any of you this morning here who find yourself caught up in all of this, you get caught up in forgetfulness or unthankfulness or you just get distracted, it's not too late to turn back. It's not too late to tell the Lord that. Lord, I'm sorry I forgot about you. You don't have to come up here to this altar with the heads bowed and eyes closed, please. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. You don't have to come up to this altar to do that. You can do that right where you're sitting. Lord, I'm sorry I forgot you. Lord, help me to be more thankful. Lord, help me to not be so distracted about the cares of this world. Help me to have a heart towards you it's not too late to turn back and tell them it's not too late to go back to the feet of Jesus and say Lord thank you it's not too late to tell them Lord I know you've been good to me and I know I haven't really shown it, but thank you. It's not too late to be asked to ask the Lord how to use you. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, please. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray for these people who came up here. And we're going to pray for those people who prayed in their seats. And we're going to pray for those people who who the Lord spoke to today, and I hope there's somebody here the Lord spoke to today because this is a problem within our church. Lord, thank you so much for, for showing us the mercy. Lord, thank you so much for showing us that we had a problem because without us having this problem, those men never would have seen you. Those men never would have came to you if they didn't have this problem. It's awful hard to thank you for, for us having the problems, but if these men didn't have leprosy, would they have come to you? So thank you for the problems you put in our, in our plate, in our path. Thank you for helping us to overcome some of those things and help us use those things to draw closer to you. Lord, thank you for hearing our pleas. Lord, when we cry out to you, thank you for listening. I pray that we have a heart that does that more often. I pray for each one of these people that they have a heart that reaches out to you. Not just when they have a problem, but just that they have a desire to speak with you and have a relationship with you. And Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for the son. Thank you for the sacrifice he made, the purification that we, we receive because of his sacrifice, Lord. I thank you for everything you've done for us today, Lord. 
I thank you for allowing us to be here in church. I thank you for the ability to glorify you here. I thank you for the for the opportunity to get to speak to people about you, Lord. That's such a blessing to me. It's a high calling and it's an honor, Lord. And I pray that you give these people the same calling to speak to somebody else about you because they have a problem and they have know how to fix the problem and the rest of the world has the same problem that we did. Lord, thank you for everything you've done for us. We are holy and woefully undeserving of it. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Keep us safe. Preserve us until we come back the next time. We can honor and glorify you some more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.